get some uh, <coughs> very strange um, experiences. Jonathan can tell you about them, and I appreciate him. I enjoyed his preaching yesterday. I enjoyed the pastor's preaching. I enjoyed my own preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else did, but uh, no, I tell you, it's uh, and we talked about it afterwards. We went out to get a bite to eat, and I said, you know, it's kind of like uh, Moses when he was up on the mountain with God, and he came down and he wished not that his face shone. And there's a glow that you get from the Holy Spirit when you're out there. Not that everybody's going to go on out there, but God's all called us to be soldiers. And a, and a soldier of the cross doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this world. You see? So we have one focal point because we got one realization. We've got eternity ahead of us. We got what a, a life that seems long to us, but the Bible measures it in the vapor, and it's the only opportunity that we'll ever have throughout all eternity to please God by faith. I don't know what the dividends pay. I don't know, but I do know right now that there's dividends right now, even though some of them come in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, shape of heartbreak. It's still something that you can offer God. I talked to some people yesterday. I said, you know, it was, uh, it was Job who, who uh, when he experienced these things, and, and, and the Bible says, uh, when he got the bad news, as that, he says, I only am left alone to tell you. There was one that escaped. While he was yet speaking, then another one came and gave him more bad news. While he was yet speaking, and all of them said, I am left alone. I'm, I'm the only one to escape. And that's Satan's greatest advantage is if he does something disastrous but leaves somebody around to testify for him. So we all quake in our boots and we think that he's more powerful than God. And what did Job do? And the last one was the coup de grace was when they heard that, uh, that his seven sons and his three daughters were in a pavilion and a great wind from the north came down, blew it down and killed his ten children just like that. And he uh, Job shaved his head, put himself in sackcloth, uh, sackcloth and ashes. He said, I came into this world naked. I'm going out naked, and I'm going to praise God. Now, Satan was wrong, and then, then it was another day. I'm not getting into that, and as a matter of fact, uh, this might disappoint Slaughter, I mean uh, Annabelle, <laughs> uh, but um, she likes that name, and she'd appreciate it if you call her that. But anyway, uh, uh, she said she hoped I had three points. I only really have one point. We got to look at a lot of groundwork, and a lot of this is familiar, but I want to I wanna bring out one point that I've been thinking about. I'm not a prophecy preacher. I've taken prophecy with a grain of salt all my saved life. We all hope that we can escape death by the rapture. Uh, we know that the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. That means it comes without warning. There's no dress rehearsals for uh, the rapture. There's no dress rehearsals for death. There's no dress rehearsals for judgment. It happens. We are, the world has to live by faith. The world has to live by faith. We are invited to live by faith, but we have grace to do it because we realize what the outcome is. Just, and I want to, we're going to look at some scripture here as groundwork. It's very, very familiar, but I want to make one point of something that we've recently experienced uh, in just a little over a month ago, and I really think it's significant. And, and before I start that, open up this uh, Acts 13, and uh, we'll look at some other scriptures, but I just want to give a verse of scripture as the springboard here, and I, and I don't mean to minimize uh, the Bible by calling it that. Uh, uh, I was looking at this, and I've just been puzzling over uh, which way to go because I could start at any point and still come up with what's on my heart. But in Acts 13, uh, and I'm in Revelation 13, and I want to go to Acts, Acts 13:41. Acts 13, 41. Behold ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, as we look into your word, as we consider the things that are uh, in your word about these last days, and we consider our, our relationship to them, Father, we pray that the Spirit of God, 
your Holy Spirit that dwells in every born-again believer will awaken us and help us to realize that we're, the time is short. And, Father, that uh, uh, we would live for you the way we wished we had when we bow in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, now, it says that, and then uh, uh, before I even read that, it says uh, that's a reference in Scripture, and it's also in Habakkuk. You don't have to turn there. Uh, well, you can if you want. Habakkuk uh, 1, verse 5. Uh, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. Uh, and then I want to read this other verse because I want to make a reference to something uh, that happened at uh, Shree Preachers uh, uh, when we were down in Cary, Ohio, that we experienced. And this verse jumped off the page uh, after that happened. And it says, For lo, I raise up uh, uh, the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the uh, breadth and the la of the land to possess uh, the dwelling places uh, that are not theirs. We, uh, and the dwelling places that are not there. Uh, when we were in Cary, Ohio, a number of years ago, the street preachers, uh, and it was the first time I ever preached. And the, the uh, message I started out with, uh, and I told the preachers, because I went to New York with them, and um, I wanted to preach, but I didn't preach. We passed out tracts, we talked to people one-on-one, -on -one, but to me, uh, that was an, uh, an odd thing. Uh, I considered street preachers oddballs. I mean, I really did. Uh, you know, I'd seen them in New York before and everything. You would watch there just out of curiosity and stuff like that, but you thought that was really odd, and yet that is the, uh, the commission. So I told Brother Bill and Brother George, I said, I'll preach this time, but I want to preach first, because if I don't, I'll chicken out, and the other thing is, I don't want to preach somebody else's message. So when I get up to preach there, I started out with uh, Jeremiah 22, 29, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. The Chaldeans there, they took over what the Polish Catholics used to be when they went down there and worshiped that piece of cement, a uh, 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 um, um, uh, statue of Mary. And uh, they, the, the Chaldeans went down there, these Catholic Chaldeans went down there. There was a riot that broke out. And I'm not telling you some little minor thing because I can say, well, it was a riot. You probably figure somebody shoved somebody. No, they were, I mean, it was brutal. Three police officers were sent to the hospital in that riot. They hated our guts, and these are professing Christians. And when I looked at that, that bitter and hasty nation, God says, I'll raise up the Chaldeans. Well, they, they're that way. Uh, we went, they, when we went back down there the next year, there was every agency from the government down there. Homeland Security, there was FBI, there was people up in a vacant house with cameras, they had drapes over there, there was police on horseback and everything else. And you know who was inciting the riot there? The Catholic monks. The Catholic monks. And I preached, um, uh, they all did, but I, I preached Matthew 23. Woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you compass, you, 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 you uh, shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, and those that would go in, you hinder. So, and we preached all that. It started to rain. Everybody laughed at us and ran into the Catholic church. We stayed out there and preached. The police stayed out there with their ponchos on, and they, and they just listened to it. Out of all that, the least ways the police officers got to hear the message. And we preach Jesus Christ. We do not preach politics, or we do not preach against sin, unless they push sin in our face. Uh, but, uh, you know, like sodomite behavior and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, they got to hear that. When the rain stopped, they came back out. We were still preaching there. The Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, in 1988, and this isn't something new, there have been preachers preaching. I remember listening to, and I will not badmouth them, although I don't listen to them now, and if I did, I probably wouldn't agree with them, not because I'm smarter or anything like that. I adhere to the Bible, and the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar, and the Bible says that we're not smart, but we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in us is hard, smart, and, and when you hear something that might sound very good and religious, but it doesn't click, the Holy Spirit says, watch out, watch out. He warns us not to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. 
but I listened to, and I didn't ever put my feet down on everything that they said, and, and obviously time has proved that everything that they said was going to happen in 1972, 1973, 1976, all of it, well, it didn't happen, we're still here, right? So, so obviously, and, I, and, and, and there is uh, two uh, fables, there's two fables that typify, to me, that typify the church. They typify the world too, but more importantly the church because the church is the existence of this world. When God withdraws the church from this world, its days are really numbered and there'll be great tribulation such as never was. Now, so the staying factor in this world is the church itself. So we, 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 insulate, we insulate the world from judgment and yet they hate the insulator. The world does. Uh, but uh, there, there, there's, um, there was a, a book out by Edgar Wisnett, and 88 Reasons Why uh, the Lord Will Return in 1988. He copyrighted that book in 1988, so it wasn't a money-making ploy. Because I heard a preacher said, oh, I read that years ago. He lied. Baptist preacher lied about that because he couldn't have read it years ago if it was copyrighted in, 18, in 1988. See? But it's something you can, you know, like you're on top of everything. Edgar Wisnett got a lot of clout in the news industry because he was a NASA uh, um, engineer. He was well known, he had, and he was a Bible student. And he tried to calculate. The world believed Edgar Wisnett. The religious world, not Christian world, but the religious world had him on the stations and they believed Edgar Wisnett, and they took him verbatim, everything. Everybody couldn't get enough of what he was saying until the date passed. I saw this myself on Good Morning America, Charlie Gibson and whoever else was on the thing, and they were over in the North Atlantic. They, might have, they were on the coast. The waves were washing up there. It might have been Sweden or something like that, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and Charlie Gibson says, well, we try to get a hold of Edgar Wisnett because uh, Jesus Christ did not come back yesterday when he was supposed to, and he hasn't come back today, and he said he might have been off in his calculations, so I guess we'll have to take it a day at a time, and everybody laughed. You know what I thought? I thought this was great. You know why? Because I got a glimpse of what the world will be like after the rapture. And I've preached this, and other preachers have preached it too, that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will buy your affections through your wallet. There will be a good economy, and he will, and people, and God, and I was talking to people yesterday, I've said this a number of times when I witnessed to people, you cannot serve God and mammon. You, you're either going to hold to the one and uh, despise the other, or you're going to love the one and hate the other. And if you don't love God, you are going to love mammon. And mammon is not just isolated to money, it's materialism, but it takes, material, it takes money to get materialism. So you, and, 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 and when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he'll come, first of all, with a good economy. Now, I've got one point, but I'm going to hold off on this because we're going to look on, not because I want to create suspense, it's because after I say that, then there's nothing else I can say, and I'll have to shut up, and I'll disappoint. Um, sorry, Annabelle. <laughs> anyway, uh, I love to pick on her. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, but we want to look at some familiar scriptures. Turn over to Matthew 24, and some of them I spoke on here before, and I wasn't the first one to do it. Uh, but we ought to keep familiar with these things. You know, the Bible says that these are, if you don't see these things, you're blind and you cannot see afar off. Well, what does that mean? That you used to be able to see two miles down the road, now you can't only see but two blocks? No, when you get away from the Word of God and you get away from the encouragement of the Word of God, you don't see, you don't see the eminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what will the eminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that is uppermost in your mind, and by the way, and in your heart, but in your mind, why? Because if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the, the, you would think the next work would be eyes, but it's not, it's the mind. Why? Because when Jesus began to preach, from that time, the Bible says, he began to preach, and the first word out of his mouth was, repent. And repent means you look it up. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. You do the etymology through the strong concordance and everything. It means to change your mind. So that's why Satan blinds your mind. 
when, when God, and we'll get into this in a minute if we get in, a, uh, and I'll read uh, uh, most of Matthew 24, but uh, when God said to Adam, and, and, and Satan was there, I know it, because of the tenor of the words that the serpent used when he said, you shall not surely die, after Eve, Eve said, we may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, wrong tree, uh, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God didn't say, lest you die. God knows how to say, lest you die. That isn't recorded in, in the book of Leviticus. God said, don't do this, lest you die. So God knew how to say that, but he didn't say that. He said, you'll surely die. Now, when when Satan saw that God had made out of dirt, out of dirt, not the gold and the carbuncles and the, and, the, and the diamonds and the barrels that Lucifer was made out of, which he is still a beautiful creature. The Bible says and to the Corinthians, inspired of God, that he appears as an angel of light. He's beautiful. He's going to be attractive. Now, when God said that, in the day that, you eat it, uh, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, Satan wanted to get them to, to the position where they'd have to die. Why? Then there would be no more race that was uh, in the image of God. Didn't work that way. You have the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15 of, of the Messiah coming. And it's in Genesis 3.15. And, that, and that's it. And then you have that all the way through the Bible. And nobody knew what was unfolding there until we knew that it was in uh, the, the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel, which wasn't developed. There was no Hebrews before Abraham, and Abraham was a Gentile. He's the first man that's called a Hebrew. Israel was uh, the name given to Jacob. Jacob meant supplanter. He was underhanded. He was a conniver. He was sneaky. And it's part of the Jewish character. I mean, you can't get away from that, you know? That's why they're despised by the world. But I say this. You cannot be a Christian and be anti-Semitic. You can't do it. I talked to an Orthodox Jewish woman uh, a week and a half ago on a Wednesday, and I'm telling you, and I, and I offered her a booklet, What Does It Mean to Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And uh, she wouldn't accept it, and, and I respectfully put it back down. But I gave her scripture, and we had a very interesting conversation. No, well, you do this. And we do. No, it was very uh, good, and she was very open to it. And I told her some of the same things we're going to look at tonight, how the Jews are being fattened up for the slaughter. Uh, but uh, we had that, and, but I gave her what the Old Testament says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth its hand. And showing them all about the scripture. And what's amazing to them, because I know a lot of Jewish secular history because I just enjoy it. And I read the book, Old Jerusalem, 700 some pages. I couldn't hardly put it down. And it was a, not a, a fiction book. It was a book, uh, uh, um, um, it was, uh, what do you call that one? Well, verified by the Red Cross. So it was not fiction. And it was about 1947, 1948. And they're surprised that you know that much. When we were preaching in, uh, in Ann Arbor one time, a young man named David, he was very, uh, uh, he was like antagonistic and came up and said, you know about this because he was Jewish. And I said, listen, my savior is Jewish. Talked to him for a long time. He said, well, I got to go. And he apologetically said, I got to go. A young man shook my hand. I uh, even took the uh, gospel track. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And said, I'll read it. And he walked away, and he, another preacher got up, and he just started listening to him for a minute. And, uh, and just in a little bit of time, some guy who professed to be a Christian ran up to me and threw, me, threw a uh, cold uh, cup of water in my face. Well, I didn't mind it too much. It was a hot day, and I don't think that's what God meant by giving a cup of cold water. <laughs> but do you know, and that, do you know, and I said that for this reason, uh, that Jewish young man, probably 20 years old, saw that, came over and apologized to me for what that guy did, and he ran off like a sniveling coward that he was anyway. I'm telling you, now, Edgar Wisnett said that, uh, 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 that Christ was coming. The, there is two, all these things, and not only that, but uh, uh, Baptist preachers have predicted I mean, all kinds of preachers. There was a fellow out in California, three times he predicted the return of Jesus Christ. And every time he did, people threw millions of dollars at him. They did. It's a record. He's dead now. He knows better. He's probably with uh, uh, Sagan and uh, Hawkins, and now he knows better. I don't, you know, I just don't see how people do that, you know, and, and claim to serve God. 
Now, here's the two fables that uh, typify the church. It typifies the world too, but more importantly, the church. And one of them is the emperor's new clothes, and you already, most of you know that, and if you don't, I'm not gonna go into it other than uh, this pompous king who was, uh, who was just uh, an egotistical, and he wanted to have the best and best and best of everything, and these charlatans came in there, and they came in with nothing, and they said, only a fool couldn't see this, uh, and the king said, well, I, if I can't, can't see it, I'd be a fool. So everybody else down the line to all the peasants didn't admit that they couldn't see the, the, these uh, invisible clothes because nobody wanted to be identified as a fool until the day that the king went out in public and we strutting his stuff and a kid says, hey, how come the king's in his underwear? And then everybody saw it. So everybody's fooled and, it's, and there's no fool like a fool that gets fooled from this side of the pulpit. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And there's no reason for any of you to be fooled because you have this not this not him this now the other one is the boy who cried wolf and you know that one too but just in case uh the boy they he's, uh, he's breaking him in as a shepherd he's up there watching it and they said to him the townspeople if a wolf comes you cry wolf and we'll go on up there and help you so he's not sure if they'll come up and he tries wolf and he go on up there no wolf then he goes oh maybe they won't trust me the second time so he cries wolf again and they all come up there to help him. And they go, oh man, what if a wolf does come? I better try it one more time. He tries it again, they come on up there. Third time, after the third time a wolf comes, he cries wolf, nobody pays attention to him. That's what prophecy preaching has worn out already in, in this generation. It's already said that. So going with that and, and saying all that, then I'm going into this right in here. Because it says, God says, I'll do a work that you won't believe though a man declare it to you. Now, I'm not saying I'm that man to declare it to you. I'm just saying God says that as the truth right there. And he said it in the Old Testament. It's quoted in the book of Acts. That there's things that are happening that we don't see. I mean, that we do see, but we don't, we don't, we don't even, you know, we know, I know, and I'm pretty sure you have the same feelings as I do. We know the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. We hope the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, but we don't think he's coming in our lifetime. All right? I mean, I feel like that. I would like him to come. I would like to forego the expense of a funeral. You say, well, if you die, what do you care? Well, I still don't want to give him the money. <laughs> I just don't. You say, well, you're going to leave it behind. Well, okay. And it's not that I'm afraid of death. I, I know that already by an experience I'm, since I've been saved. I'm not. I'm disappointed when it didn't happen. I mean, I just really, when I got rushed to the, uh, when I had to go to the emergency room a year ago, February, I was thinking I was going to have supper in heaven. And I was disappointed when it didn't happen. I told my wife, and listen, I'm not being funny. I'm just, uh, I said, I told my wife, I said, well, you see this fellow here? He's got the uh, uh, counting thing, and you do this, and you got this all set up she wouldn't be left uh, with any uh, uh, a bag to hold that's going to put her in a hard way all of that was taken care of because I've worked for widow women and I've seen them where their husband and they didn't know what was going on their husband went in debt and spent all the money then they kicked off and they're stuck and they don't know what to do uh, my wife is not going to be like that now uh, now let me get into this because a lot of this is familiar and then I want to get to the one point one point <laughs> anyway uh, now, now let's look at this right in here this is very familiar but uh, Matthew 24 uh, and Jesus went uh, out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him uh, for to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said unto them see not all these things verily I say unto you there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down now, this happened in 1970 when Titus went in and actually told them not, according to history, told them not to destroy the temple. But they hated the Jews so much. I mean, there's an inveterate hatred for Jews that is, is superhuman. It's satanic. It is satanic. Now, they went in there and out of their rage, they burned it and any of the gold that that in a temple from what I understand this is tradition it's not in the Bible but Jesus said not one stone will be left upon another now all they had to do was have one of those massive stones on sitting on one and that would have dis that's all I need is one and that would have discredited what Jesus said didn't do it the gold ran from what I understand into all of that and Titus was so infuriated with their insubordination that he made him take all the rocks down and scrape them to get the gold off 
You say, would they do that? Hitler did it when he started pulling teeth and they showed barrels. They showed them. It wasn't just Hollywood stuff. They showed barrels of fillings, gold fillings that they've taken from Jews in the death camps. Now, so he says, uh, in, uh, uh, and, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, verse uh, 3, uh, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, and by the way, it, it's, not, it's significant that he sat upon the Mount of Olives because when Jesus comes back, not in a rapture, but after the rapture, after the tribulation, you know where he comes to? Mount of Olives. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, we, you know, just, I mean, we just got something great. We got something we don't deserve, and he's given us something that we do not deserve do not do not deserve and that is the ministry of reconciliation we do not deserve that and he's given us the word of reconciliation and there's nothing in us that really deserves that except that which is born of God is as holy and as godlike as God is himself and it's in me and it was purchased not by me going to church but by me repenting at the cross of Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the, by the faith of. Not mine. It wouldn't work. Mine can't get going. Mine can look at the world and do like Peter did and see the wind and the, and the waves and the boisterous wind and start to sink and say, Lord, save me. But I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave me a supernatural faith for a supernatural ministry, and that ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. You know, and he said, now I know a lot of people don't understand this and I can't really articulate it, but I believe it. He's given us a better ministry than he had himself. You know why? Because I can lead people to himself. He purchased salvation, but I have the, the high and lofty and holy goal of leading people to Christ. You say, how many people have you led to Christ? I, know, I don't know, God only knows, of the tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands I've preached to in all these years of street preaching and one-on-one, -on -one, and I witnessed to people that when I was saved, be, while I was still a Catholic, God knows that's true. And I led every one of them to Christ. You said they all got saved? No, no, I don't know. But I led them to Christ. And that's your ministry, is to lead them to Christ. That's yours. That, you know, you got led to Christ. Nobody saved you. You got led to Christ. Uh, uh, Dwight L. Moody preaching out on the street one time, and he used to get out of Chicago, and he put the Bible on the ground, from what I heard, it wasn't there, and he's walking around, and he's going, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And people would stop and look at this nut, you know? And a crowd begets a crowd, and he'd look up, and it'd be about 20 people there, he'd pick it up, and he'd preach. It's the living word of God. And one time when he was doing that, while he was preaching, a drunk came by and he goes, Hey, Mr. Moody, I'm one of your converts. And he said, You must be. You ain't the Lord's. See? You know? I mean, there's people that think that they're saved. You know, and, and because somebody's talked them into it. God's never told us to talk anybody into it. If there was a prayer that was the magic bullet that could say, Bow your head and repeat after me, don't you think you leave God out of the picture. Don't you think that Paul, and he was brilliant, and I don't say that because I can understand brilliance, I just know he was brilliant because of other men's testimonies about him. And don't you think he would have been smart enough to put that prayer in there? And then you put God in the equation and you cannot escape that thought that God would have put that. No, no. You preach the word. And, and, and I was talking to somebody, you know, the Bible says, that uh, I was talking to him yesterday. I said, there's another unique verse in the Bible, and it says, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and he that loveth it shall eat the fruit thereof. And you say, what does that mean? Well, what do you love, life or death? See? Life and death. Are, and we are a savor of life unto life, and we are a savor of death unto death. And you see that on the cross when Jesus is on the cross and you're both ridiculing, one on his left, one on his right. And then after a while, the one on the side, one side said, uh, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. They both witnessed the same thing. They both heard the same thing. And they both had the same opportunity to get saved. One of them did, one of them didn't. You got the same opportunity that I have. 
and those people that you witness to out there why do i know that because the grace of god that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men and god god would not let jesus go and die on the cross and become sin for you who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He did not let, let him taste death for every man and then say to somebody who wants to repent, and God says, I think I'll just let them sweat. You know, they kind of take, no, that, you don't even have God in your mind to think like that. For God, and the next word is immeasurable, so love the world. I was telling these people yesterday, I said, you know what time? And I don't mean to point at myself because Jonathan has the same experience. The pastor has the same experience. Bill and George have the same experiences. But one time, and I just, I didn't even think about it. Uh, a lot of things I say without thinking first. I know. But anyway, uh, uh, but um, uh, we were preaching down in Detroit. And, and you know, it's like uh, we're the minority. It's 90% black as they're going over to uh, Hart Plaza. I'm just saying that's a fact of life. Black and white is a fact of life. You know, somebody does something, you say, were they black or white? I mean, you don't have to be prejudiced or anything like that. I've had somebody say to me, are you a racist? I said, I used to be, but I walk a lot. But anyway, I got up there and I said, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave. And I said, how many of you finished that in your head? And they all turned around, and most of them did, and they raised their hand. They were stopped at the light. They couldn't go anywhere. And they said, I did, I did. And I said, well, it don't count unless you finish it in your heart. You know what they said? Amen. <laughs> that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. You see, the heart is capable of believing things that this up here can't. It's too finite. I, I like to watch Nova. I like to watch these different programs. And they, I, even these are brilliant minds. I have to break it down to my vocabulary because uh, if they didn't, uh, they wouldn't have an audience. But they do not understand the things that we live in every day. They do not understand time because they say time is elastic. I know that time is going faster now, not because I'm older, but it's going faster for everybody. Time is speeding up. Einstein proved that, and I ain't got time to go into that, just from what he said, and they proved it in a model. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, they bring all these things down, and they're saying things that we live in every day and we do not understand. It's going to be amazing. One split second after you breathe your last breath, after this ticks its last tick, you're going to understand everything, even if you're lost. Now, so let me go on here. It says uh, uh, in verse 4, and Jesus answered, oh, let me read verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? They asked him three questions. That's everything. That, that's, that's what we want to know, right? I'm gonna, just going to skip through this, hopefully, because I want to get a few other uh, scriptures, uh, 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 areas in here. And then I want to get to that one point. Uh, verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. All right, I have to make a comment here. He did not say, many will come in their name, saying they are Christ. We've had people that said that, the Lord of the universe and all that. And I can give you examples, but I just don't want to take the time. Uh, but anyway, he said, many will come in my name, saying I am Christ. He didn't say many will come in their name, saying they are Christ. He didn't say many will come in my name, saying they are Christ. He didn't say many will come in their name, saying I am Christ. He said, many will come in my name, first person singular, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. You see, the world knows about Jesus Christ. It is a historic fact. Now, but they say Jesus is Lord, but they do not mean the same thing that I say when I do that as a born-again believer. They do not mean the same thing. And, and, and they'll say that. So many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now, I know that many are wrong. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Matthew chapter 7. Why does the gate brought us away to lead us to destruction? And many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Many will come to me. Uses the word many, same chapter. Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then Jesus said, well, I profess unto them, depart from me that work iniquity, I never knew you. In Titus it says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every, every, every good work reprobate. What does that good work? Well, they go to church. They've done many wonderful works. It doesn't talk about every work is, and their good works are reprobate. 
Jesus said he identified them as workers of iniquity. You know what a worker of iniquity is? May not be in every sense, but in this one it certainly is. They're people who use religion to buy off their convicted conscience. And they don't want to give up their sin, so they do something religion. i got to go to church. When I was a Catholic, they had it all Saturday there. Boy, you could pay for the, uh, all your sins. All you had to do was confession, go to confession, and then kind of live good. And then you say, well, it's Friday. Man, I can live like hell. And I hate to say it just like that, but that's the thought. And then tomorrow, go to confession and get it all taken care of. Well, that's nonsense. You're just going to hell with religion. You say, well, that's the Catholic. Baptists do the same thing. Either you know Christ or you don't know him. Having a form of godliness, and by the way, here's an acid test. It's given in John chapter 14. It says, uh, Judas came to him, not a scare. It says, Lord, how is it that you'll reveal yourself to us and not to the world? If a man loves me, he'll, thank you, keeps his, and he'll keep his word. You see, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So you have a desire for the Word of God, and now you're clean through the Word. So when you feel dirty, you don't have to go to the preacher or the priest and say, you know, and spill your guts out. And you don't want to do that because he'll spill them out for you again to everybody else. Not our pastor. But, but you know, I mean, you know, you, you, we have, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So he says, now you're clean through the word. We look at, we've been looking at that in Sunday school in, in 1 John chapter 3, that uh, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we see him we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And, and, and what happens when you have that? And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure not close to being him but even as he is pure and how do you do that now you are clean through the word which i've spoken unto you there's only one thing that can clean you and it's the word of god and that is both the word the written word which when jesus died on the cross and was buried that was nice but when he rose again he conquered the world the flesh and the devil it was by his resurrection he tasted death for every man he rose that we could rise from the dead too but he did what he did three significant things he did a whole host of things that I'm not even aware of but he did three significant things uh, when he rose from the dead that was he paid for my redemption that's first and foremost secondly he made this the living word of God instead of just accurate history he made it the living word of God there is no book on the face of the earth that's why it's being that's why it's being um, uh, revised the first time the word of God was revised in its own language was in Genesis chapter 3 it's not a translation it's a revision it was revised in its own language is Genesis chapter 3 and the results was death when Jesus was tempted of the devil, he used the most powerful weapon to defeat the devil. And you know what he said? And he quoted out of the same book, Deuteronomy. It is written. That's the only, the, the, the take on the whole armor of God. It's the word of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, pulling down strongholds and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, how do you do that exalt yourself against the knowledge of God because you're told to grow in grace and in knowledge so you counter rock evil knowledge with godly knowledge and you can't get that unless you study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth verse 5 um, and many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many and ye shall hear wars and rumors of war see that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass uh, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, uh, and there shall be uh, famines and earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 10, and there shall uh, many be, uh, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And this is talking about the Jewish nation. Now the Jews experienced something in World War II. In, uh, oh man, I forgot the name of that country. Lithuania. In Lithuania, there was a place that, uh, that, uh, 
Napoleon Bonaparte, he labeled it back in 1812, the Jerusalem of the North. I didn't know that until just a, a, just a short while before coming to church because I recently watched the documentary on that. And it was a, they have pictures of it. It was, the Druze did not want to go, they didn't want to leave Lithuania. It was beautiful, it was idyllic, it was just beautiful. They lived in peace there and in harmony until uh, the, the, um, the uh, motivation of Hitler for anti-Semitism. And then it was so bad there where they burnt down the, I mean, this was a beautiful uh, 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 synagogue that they had up there. I mean, and nobody wanted to go to Jerusalem. They had it better there. God said he'd bring them back to the land. You know what brought the Jews back to the land? It was the worldwide anti-Semitism. They tried to uh, buy that with the Zionist, you can look that up in history, the Zionist movement, the British uh, gave them a, a Balfour Declaration, they reneged on it and everything like that, uh, but what brought them back in there was the, was the Holocaust, and that was a real event. People tried to say it wasn't. They're still digging up things up there where they had mass grave sites. Even the Germans, and then so the Germans were so brutal to them that they they hoped that the Russians would come in, and because the Russians had an inveterate hatred for the for the Germans too, uh, they 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 both hated each other. And when they came down there, they brutalized the Jews even more. Now let me go on here, uh, because uh, it's, and I want to, and I'm not saying all these things just to go through history. I want to bring out one point in a bit here. And I want us to consider all these other things based on what the Bible says. Uh, and many uh, uh, false prophets, in verse uh, 11, and many false prophets uh, they, uh, shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall go, grow, uh, wax cold. Go cold. You know what that is? When religion abounds. And, and, and you know what? You look at this church now. Now, I'll tell you this. This ought to be an encouragement. There's a church down in, I think, Houston, Texas that's probably run 20,000 this morning or more. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, certainly um, uh, advertising for them. Uh, but I saw him one time before I even knew who that person was. And he had them all, uh, all the zombies that sat in the audience, not in the congregation, in the audience, because it's not preaching anymore, it's a, it's a uh, performance, and they're not a congregation anymore, they're an audience, and he had all these zombies in there repeating a mantra that meant nothing, but he, sh he showed to him how pliable and how stupid and how much of a sucker they were to follow this stuff. But we have more in our evening service than they do. <laughs> you stop and think about that, right? These churches that are out for them, they're out for money, they're out for their power and their prestige and everything. They don't have evening and mid midweek services, not unless there's money involved in it. And they try to fleece them real good on Sundays. So it says, uh, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And so when you're, an obs when you're observing what's happening in religion today, and we look at ourselves and we start, oh, we're pathetic, we're pathetic. Oh, look at this. Nobody wants to hear about God anymore. And our love begins to wax cold. But one with God, and, and Martin Luther experienced this. That's why he came up with it. One with God is a majority. And I'll tell you something, if, if there's just a few people of, of following God, I just say this in a, in a facetious way, but if there's just a few people following God and I'm one of them, then he's going to recognize me more out of, than, than if there were billions. So I would do it. I know that's facetious because he's omnipotent. God me, he knows everything. So if I was one in 15 zillion billion, he'd still recognize me if my heart wanted to know him. And just like David says, I pant after him like the heart does the brook. Yeah. <clears throat> you say, well, you're just saying that because you're in the pulpit. Well, I'll tell you what, when we get to God, you ask him if I was making it up, okay? I don't really care. I know that the heart is deceitful above, death, uh, above all things. I was telling the pastor, I've mentioned it already a few times to him. You know, when, before I get up here to speak, even on Sunday school, not that I minimize that, I do not minimize that anymore then I'd minimize the word of God. But I confess sins that I know I haven't committed because I just don't want to anything to hinder God using me. 
say, I just don't want to do it, whether you like it or not. I do not want God to hinder, uh, be hindered, and I don't, want, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. And I know I have because I'm in the flesh, so I ask God, and I remind him of what he said in 1 John, that he cleanses us from all, all, all unrighteousness. So, uh, now... Uh, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax gold. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. That's talking about flesh salvation during the tribulation. This uh, is geared to Israel right in here. It's applicable to us. Let me burn over, uh, uh, go on over to, uh, uh, in verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is uh, in the desert, uh, uh, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Uh, believe him not, and all that sort of thing. Verse uh, 31, and and he shall send uh, his angels with a great sound and a trumpet, and they shall gather uh, his elect from the four ruins on, uh, from the ends of the heaven, uh, one end of heaven to the other. Uh, back in uh, the early 70s, uh, and uh, turn over to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Back in the early 70s, there was a uh, fellow that came from India, and he was called the Maharashi. He landed over here at Metro Airport, and he was called the Lord of the Universe, and all kinds of people went over there to see him. I don't know if any of you remember that. Uh, it was in the papers. It was in the news and everything. Just a, just a young kid, you know, and they called him Lord of the Universe. Uh, that's what they called him. And, uh, and so I was up on a service call and already been reprimanded for witnessing the people. And so I was very, uh, I was trying to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. And uh, so I went on a service call for this company. And I'm telling you, uh, I already knew I had three strikes against me about getting any kind of a job, even a street sweeper's job. I mean, I knew that. And so I had this job and um, uh, I went out there. And so, uh, but my, first and foremost has been witnessing. I, I had another job and I told Mr. Harden and I had a lot of respect for him. I had all of their stores. I was making more money than I ever thought I could They're doing freelance work and all that stuff. And uh, somebody complained about that. Well, that's a given. And I worked for him. I was the best that they ever had. God knows it because God gave me, God gave me the ability to do that. I impressed myself after 40 something years of doing this. I still impressed myself. I had a cop, uh, a police officer, uh, hug me yesterday. <laughs> Second time I had one. The first one was a woman. She was very pretty, but I knew her, uh, and that was in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor, they think that the police are against you, and here this, uh, this uh, a lady police officer gave me a hug. It kind of blows them away. But anyway, uh, this fellow did, and he's a Cuban fellow, and I just did a job for him, and, he just, and I said, uh, hola, amigo, and he heard that because he's Spanish, and uh, I took my hat off because he only knows me bald, so, uh, and I was holding the battery, he came on over and gave me a hug. Really super nice guy I mean it was just great you know and all that and I don't even know why I said that but uh, uh, but anyway uh, um, but uh, anyway we'll go to 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 if it comes back to me I'll bring it up 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken neither uh, uh, neither be uh, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. Now it says that he doesn't want you to be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Do you know that Satan so, was so blatant that he had religious people write letters to the churches that were heresy, but they signed the apostles' names to it. You say, how do you know that? I just read it. I just read it. That you be not sh soon sh uh, shaken in tr or troubled by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of the Lord. See, they, they troubled this church. The church thought that the rapture already happened. By the way, if almost 2,000 years ago, uh, this church in Thessalonica thought that the rapture happened, how, why, why aren't we living breath to breath in anticipation of the Lord's uh, return? Not next week, not, not hopefully this year. I mean, breath to breath. I mean, if you're living that way, I'll tell you one thing. The knee-jerk reaction to that is you're going to live right. It's as, it's as automatic as exhaling is to inhaling. You just can't keep inhaling without blowing yourself up, you know, and dying. 
So it's as automatic. If you live with the anticipation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, then you're going to live as close to the Word of God as you can because the Word of God is quick and powerful, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. And at the last days, they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power. They deny what? What? That they say, oh, God doesn't exist. No, they deny the word of God. And how do they do that? Well, they teach philosophy, they teach psychology, they teach out of revisions. And if the word of God doesn't conform to their life, then they conform the word of God to their life, and they have another revision or perversion. I, I do not understand how when God can put a person there for adding to or taking away, and yet these people do it, and I can't just believe that. And I can prove to you, I can prove to you, and I will take the time right now, I'll just prove to you that they're liars when they say that they're, work, they're making the Word of God more compliant with our language today. That is an absolute lie. I, there's many examples, but um, uh, uh, they said uh, in Romans 5, uh, 5, 8, uh, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The word commend has a specific uh, reaction to it. When God says, I love you, the word commends means that I want to say back to God, I love you. That's what the word, and yet they've changed that in the NIV and the uh, New King James to God demonstrate. Now, okay, now, now I want to I, I be, be very clear on this. It's fair in itself. I want to be very clear on this. If they're changing the word of God to bring it up to modern day speech, then Paul apparently didn't know how to spell or say the word demonstrate, right? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you come to that conclusion? Yet that's in the authorized Bible when Paul and he used it once in demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. So they are liars and the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. It takes only a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. If you, if you ran a marathon and you were dying of thirst and it was a crystal clear uh, 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 water up here, I mean, it was crystal clear. It didn't, even, it didn't go through a refinery. It came from heaven and it was crystal clear. Never had any bacteria in it. And just as you went for it, I took a little eyedropper with raw sewage and I put one drop in there. It pollutes all of that water and you can't see it little leaven leavens the whole lump I do not know I do not know why they take the Word of God and they think that they can change it to the, and I am NOT a King James only I only use the King James and there's a big difference because I have run into and I've and I've seen them and they make me sick people who say that they're King James only not all of them but some of them and they couldn't they couldn't speak and they couldn't quote themselves out of a wet paper bag they, they destroy the scripture, and they think as long as they defend the binding, then they can ad-lib. Well, that's the same thing that the, uh, that the revisionists are doing. You can't, well, the Bible says something like that, you know? If it did something like that, it's the accurate word of God. What if it said something like, uh, whosoever shall call upon the labor of the Lord, the name of the Lord might be saved? Well, that just might be. Well, then maybe you might not, you know? Well, it's just, well, it's something like that. Well, that means you're going to go to hell. If you might, go to hell. Well, I wouldn't take that. I remember when I first came here, they said, uh, and I didn't know anything about the doctrine of the security of the believer, and they said, once well, you're saved, you're always saved. And I, said, and I said, well, how do you know that? And they said, well, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Didn't, doesn't that sound pretty definite? And it says, yeah, but it says you shall be witnesses. Doesn't that sound pretty different, definite? You shall. They're both spelt the same way. S-H, but we don't want a witness. We just want what we pick and choose, you see? You know, I'll tell you, you, don't, you, you gotta let God be God. And he didn't call you to, to walk where everybody's gonna pat you on the back. If God does, that's sufficient. If God does, that's all you need. Let God be true, but every man a liar. So it says, uh, let no man deceive you in any, by any means, uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. You check this out, but that word is apostasy. Some people said that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and they use that word falling away first to, uh, to say the rapture. Well, 
in a sense that that may be true because when the apostasy takes over we are not going to fall away we are going to go up and it's not like falling down it's like going up you know uh, but the word is apostasy and we are living in the apostasy today uh, you don't make any mistake about that but you know in darkness I can light a match right now and it's not going to impress anybody but if we were in utter darkness and light a match it would impress a lot of people right I mean that light and so if the world wants to be dark then you can shine brighter now uh, uh, then it says uh, uh, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, uh, for that day shall not come except there come a falling word first, and that man of sin be revealed. Now you consider that, uh, be revealed, the man, uh, the, the son of perdition. Uh, you know, I like, uh, and I don't really make a lot about this, but I remember Bill Calvin, one of the straight preachers, and he said, you know, that he gave Judas the sop, S-O-P, right? And here you got the son of perdition. And Jesus said, haven't I called all of you 12, and one of you is a devil, you know? That's right. And, and Judas, when he died, when he hung himself, he went to his own place. Doesn't say he went to hell. The rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. So I'm not going to make a big deal about that, because that isn't the point anyway, uh, the one point. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's go on here. Uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. Now this is true about the Catholic Church, and this is true about rich people. After, you know, this know also that in the last days, and this is progressive, and I'll just explain that a minute, not that, not that I'm trying to be um, authoritative here or, or be superior in my knowledge, I'm not trying to be at all, uh, but this know also uh, uh, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, discipline. So you have a progression there, and how does that progression work out? Men shall be lovers of their own, well, what happens when you love your own self? Then you become covetous. And what happens when you become covetous? Then you become boasters. And what happens when boasting doesn't satisfy anymore? Then you become a blasphemer. You see, you start cursing God. And then what happens to disobedient parents? You raise a generation that hates God, hates, it hates their parents too. Remember the Menendez brothers? They're living in a lap of luxury. Now they finally got to be in the same prison, you know, for after the murdering their parents. See, see? Because they put all those things, materialism first, ahead of God. Uh, who, uh, and, and it says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. We're in uh, 2 Thessalonians 4, uh, 4. Who uh, exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So here, it's not sufficient to be just wealthy. When you get beyond that, and it means nothing to you, you have to be worshiped. You say, is that a characteristic? It is a satanic characteristic. If thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus said it is written. Takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple. He said, if thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down. It is written. And he quotes, he misquotes the Bible, but he quotes, he said, the angels give charge over you unless you dash your foot against the ground. Jesus said it is written. He takes him up on a mountain, shows him all the kingdoms in a moment of time. He said, this is mine. And Jesus never said, no, it's not. It was Adam's. It was you go to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, you'll find out that it was Lucifer's. And he forfeited it when he thought he could be like God. And the earth was without form and void. And then when God created man, he gave dominion of this earth to man, and man forfeited it back to Lucifer. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he did three major things. I don't know if I finished that a moment ago. He saved my soul. He made this the living word of God, and he purchased the redemption of this earth which is not redeemed yet, but it will be in the book of Revelation when John says there was a scroll there with seven seals on it and no one was found worthy. And, and, and John says, I began to weep. Because no one, and he says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And he was the near kinsman and he broke the seals and redeemed this earth. But Satan said, all this is mine and I'll give it to you if you bow down and worship me. That is inherent in the human nature. If you get to that position, either you are going to worship God or you want to be worshipped. So I don't want to be worshipped. You want to be admired. That's just another word for it. It might be a little softer and a little cheaper because we ain't got no money. But the thing of it is, once you get to that higher position, the Catholic Church right now wants back the power that it had during the Dark Ages. They, they want it back. You know, I said, I told my wife, and I'm just 
saying it right out. I'm not, they, they, our, our form of government is using our own constitution to destroy our constitution. What we are witnessing in history right now is the destruction, the dismantling of democracy right now. You say, oh, I don't believe that, that won't happen. It happened overnight in Europe and in Germany uh, 80 years ago. Don't think it can't happen now. It can, and, it, and, and it's destruction by design. People are getting frustrated because this law says you can't do this, and this law says I can do that, even to the point where the president can pardon himself. And they say, well, he can't do it. And, it, and, and everybody's got to throw their hands up and say, look, we need another definitive constitution. Then you watch out. Now, I say what they should do if all these immigrants want to come up here, what they ought to do is get a nice 747 and make it all first class and take them and drop them off over in Rome and let's see what the Pope says about them scaling their wall over there. Most of them are Catholic anyway because every government in the world, as far as I know, and I don't want to act like a geographical or political analyst, which I am not, but I know we have our own debt, which is in the trillions, right? The Catholic Church has an inestimable wealth. Nobody knows the trillions of dollars that they, that they possess, not only in their coffers, but in land and everything else. So why don't they take them over there, and they could afford to feed them, and they can let them jump their walls. I mean, I liked it when Trump said, uh, when the Pope said when he was running for president that he's going to build a wall in Mexico, and the, and the Pope says, you, you shouldn't build a wall, and, and I appreciated this. He got right back at him and said, you got a wall around the Vatican. He did? So, you know, it's a, this, this world is full of lunatics. I'm glad I'm saved. I mean, I mean I'm, I, I'm a lunatic too, but at least ways I can identify it, you know? Uh, anyway, it says, uh, now it says, um, and, and, um, and now we know what withholdeth, and verse 6, and now we know uh, what withholdeth, uh, well, in verse 5, he says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you all these things. So we already have them in the word of God. We looked at it in Matthew 24. And now you know what withholdeth uh, that he might be revealed in his time. Well, what is that? For the mystery of iniquity, verse 7, uh, doth, uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And Matthew 24 says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Do you know what the greatest vehicle for Satan to get people to go to hell is? It's not vice. It's not drugs. It's religion. It's religion. And you say, oh, you're just saying that because other preachers are saying it. No, I'm saying it because Matthew 7 says that. Many will come to me saying, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not? They're talking about religious people. Now, it says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let. That's an old English way of saying he who hinders. And I'm not revising it. That's what that word meant back uh, in the 1600s. Uh, let it, you know, uh, or we can say it. I'm not going to let you do that, you see. So he who now left, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is keeping Satan at bay right now. Now, if I believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, and I believe it soon, and I've only been on this planet for almost 70 years, what do you think Satan, who's been here manipulating things, and who knows how long before when he was Lucifer, but how long since uh, the fall, how he can calculate it, and everything is set up, but he can't do it yet until the Holy Spirit, that is the true church that is taken out. And when that true church is taken out, there won't be all hell that breaks loose on the planet. It'll be a time of prosperity. It'll be a time of affluence. It'll be a time when people will sing in that old gospel hymn, happy days are here again. You say, that isn't a gospel hymn. It is if you're, if you're, uh, 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 if you're worshiping mammon, right? Now, uh, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now we know what withholdeth that he might be uh, revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Now then, when the spirit is taken away, then shall that wicked be revealed, uh, whom the Lord shall consume with his spirit and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish because, because they receive not, not the, the truth, a lot of people receive the truth, but they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, and let's, let's read that, right? For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Not the devil. 
God shall send them strong delusion that they all might be, oh, oh, we don't want to say that in church, that they all might be damned who had pleasure in unrighteousness. I, I just quoted that. Let me read it here and say, make sure I get it right. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they all might, uh, that, uh, uh, that they should believe a lie and that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, now, now, very quickly here, uh, very quickly, we'll go to uh, uh, Revelation 13, and I'll try to do this without comment, but I'll just read some of the verses here. Revelation 13. Now, we're going to go... We're going to go to the book of Daniels for the point. But right in here, I just want to say this in verse uh, 11. And, be, and I beheld a beast coming up out of the earth, and uh, he had two horns like a uh, lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and, uh, causes, the, uh, and, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast who had, who had a deadly wound and was healed. And he, doth, uh, and he doeth great wonders, uh, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven uh, on the earth uh, in the sight of men. I have personally believed this for many years, although I can't prove it. In any military campaign, higher, the higher the ground, the more the, you have the advantage in a military campaign, right? Wouldn't you say that? And, and you can't get any higher ground, humanly speaking, than outer space. I saw this myself a few years ago on the internet that China said that we ought not to bring the atomic age into outer space. Why? Because they deployed two atomic bombs out in outer space. Why? Because we are a superior. When Trump says, I have a bigger button, button, when he said that to North Korea, he wasn't kidding. Do you think that they capitulated? Uh, well, they enticed them the same way that the world is being enticed with wealth. Right? Have any of you watched that? That? They were enticed with them. They took them out and they showed them Singapore and it's a very, it's, it, it, they're, they're, they're capitalizing on all the wealth that's in the world Well, North Korea is starving to death and eating rats and whatever else they're eating, right? They didn't even know if he had enough money and he's the, he's the head guy over there. They didn't know if he had enough money to pay his uh, hotel bill. And that, that's what they said on TV. I don't think they were ridiculing him. You know, so uh, before, and what, what was the enticement? Uh, world, the world, and so wealth, and all this other thing, and so that's the enticement of the world here, you see? Um, I just went to get my uh, license renewed because I had to get down there and take a test and everything, and they wanted my birth certificate. I don't have one. I mean, I do, and I don't know where it's at. I couldn't find it. Uh, so, but I had the application when I went for my um, uh, passport from New York, because I was born in the Bronx, and they said, uh, and they showed that, so I brought that, and they said, no, that wouldn't be sufficient. Now, you are not, I am not going to be able to fly domestically without that. I'm telling you, their noose is putting on us, or everything is set into place here, so you won't even be able to probably pass county lines if you survive uh, the uh, rapture, because you're lost. You will not even be able to cross probably county lines because the chip is coming, and, and you say, oh, we've heard about that. Well, that, I know, that's what the boy of pride wall. And, uh, and there's gonna be scoffers in the last days saying, but I'll tell you, it's coming right now, where it is a burden for people, and I'm a merchant, and it's a burden to take cash from people. I would rather take their credit card. Do you know that years ago, and, and I'm not running off here, so, because uh, I didn't get to that point, and I, and I want you to know it's a short message because I only got one point. But anyway, uh, uh, do you know that years ago they showed this on, uh, and, and my, uh, I talked to my brother down in Brazil about this, and they did the same thing with soccer. But they showed uh, people going to a coffee shop, and it was just like, they were just like zombies, and they were going like this, and they get their coffee, and they go like this, and it was like a production line. People were swiping their credit card, and they were going like that. They did the same thing in a flower shop, beautiful sunny day, they got this huge uh, sunflower out there and it's bright beaming and the water is going almost like uh, in, 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 in sink, watering these, shooting across there and watering these plants. And they're doing all that. And, uh, uh, and then somebody comes on up and they get their wallet out, the flower droops, it gets cloudy, the water stops, in the coffee shop, everybody goes, Ugh. 
Do you know what the music was playing on both of those? You could probably YouTube it. The music that was playing on both of those commercials was Handel's Messiah, Hallelujah. Do you tell me that there isn't some kind of religious connection to the world? Now, so they have a form of godliness, but no power. Now, now let me finish reading here, and then we'll get to uh, Daniel. And he deceiveth them, verse uh, uh, 14, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth uh, by the means of those uh, uh, miracles which he hath power to do. Oh, and what, what I was going to say, and I want to say this, is uh, the International Space Station, I, don't know, I do not know this at all, but I do know this, that if he has power to call down fire from heaven, Satan is not God. He has to do it mechanically. When I was a kid, both in Miami and New York, we'd get a, a neat little toy, it was a magnifying glass, and an ant could walk on the sidewalk in New York, and it wouldn't bother him the sun, being out in the sun. I could harness the energy of that sun with a magnifying glass and watch that uh, ant curl up and turn into a crispy critter. So, well, that's pretty bad. Well, I wasn't a Hindu, so it didn't bother me. But anyway, uh, uh, because I wasn't killing anybody's relative. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I'm not trying to make light of that, but I'm just saying. But now, if they can do that from outer space, and all of us stockpiling, and I know that this happened in Japan with their flagship that they were even afraid to put out there, and when that blew up, it capsized and blew up, it was, it was more powerful than the bomb that they dropped on Hiroshima, that, that, the thousands of tons of dynamite that they had in this big ship, and the guns were on it were bigger than any of our guns, but they were afraid to lose it, so they kept it inland. Check it out in history. I'm just saying. But what I'm saying is when a, when, a, when a nation stockpiles their weapons and from outer space we can put a magnifying glass and if you watch anything about Tesla, he believed and he proved that you could uh, point a beam at something and make it blow up. Jonathan, do you ever watch that stuff about Tesla? See, they could do that and that was, that was archaic. I mean, that's uh, 50, uh, 70 years ago. Uh, when he was uh, uh, doing that. If they can do that and they can pinpoint your, your cache of, uh, of bombs and everything, they can blow you up with your own bombs. I do not think that that was just hyperbole when uh, Trump said it'll be fire and fury. China even knew that. Now, I, I, I'm just guessing here on that, but not when it comes to the Bible and says that he will be able to call down fire from heaven. Let me go on here quickly. And uh, uh, verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause it, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be called, uh, killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead, so that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark of the beast or the number of his name. And then here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding. Turn over to uh, 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 Daniel chapter uh, 8. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and it's number 600, three score and six. Everybody makes a big deal about that. We go on out and preach on the street, and we preach that judgment is coming. People laugh at us, and they ridicule us and everything else. And, when, and, and, and I get up there and preach, and I say, listen, listen, we talk, talking about you. We're warning you. God says, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning for me. You don't warn people about good times. You warn them about impending danger or doom. And he says, give them warning for me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, you, you ridicule us for warning you about judgment to come, but Hollywood can make a movie called Armageddon, and they'll make millions of dollars, and you'll go and pay and watch it. See? So it's selective stupidity. Now, here is the point. Um, verse 24 of Daniel, you'll have to read this in context because I know I'm running over time. Sorry about that. And his, uh, and his power shall be mighty. And this is talking about the Antichrist, uh, but not in his own power. So we know it's satanic power. And not in his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policies, also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. The word practice is in the Bible seven times, six times in the Old Testament, and all of them have an evil connotation. There have been, that's been a word that's been used which with, which with, with witchcraft, 
is the practice. There's also, uh, it says, craft. There was a show on, I never watched it, but it was, it was choreographed, I guess that's what you would say, written by a, uh, a satanic priestess, and it was called The Craft. It was on TV. It was, they were all Satan worshipers. It was the, the, the occult. Now, it says, uh, Craft, prosper in his hands, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. Now, here is the point. All of that was for this. And by peace, he shall destroy many. And he shall also stand against the prince, capital prince, that's Jesus Christ, of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now, now I got to make these comments here. Since Adam and Eve, Satan has tried to destroy man. Then God gives the messianic prophecy. And it comes through the nation Israel. Uh, it comes through the line of Judah and all that. Satan's ambition has been to destroy the Jews. You go to the book of Esther and, and uh, Haman, the Agagite, is the only one in, that's identified like that. But Saul was commissioned by God to destroy all the Amalekites. Children, young, old, every Amalekite was supposed to be destroyed by Saul. Samuel comes there and he says, uh, I thought you uh, fulfilled the law of the word of God. And he says, uh, yeah, I have. And he said, well, what is this bleeding of the sheep? Am I? He was supposed to kill the animals, everything that the Amalekites had. And he says, well, we were going to get them for sacrifice. Boy, if that isn't lame, stupid religion. I mean, we were going to use them for sacrifice. No, he wasn't. So uh, Agag is spared. Well, when you read that in that context, you would think out of all the Amalekites, the only one that was spared was Agag. And I like it when the Bible says that Samuel didn't just kill him, he hewed him to pieces. You say, well, that sounds pretty bloodthirsty. No, it sounds very godly to me because that's what God told Saul to do and he didn't do it. So, okay, so now all the Amalekites are dead, right? No, they're not. No, they're not. When Saul goes into battle and he sees that he's being killed, he's wounded, and he tells his armor bearer to fall on him, and his armor bearer did that, and, and then he, the armor bearer killed himself, but Saul's life was still holding him, and he saw somebody coming. He said, who are you? And he said, I'm a stranger. I'm an Amalekite. And the Amalekite killed him, took his bracelet and, and uh, crown, and he went to David, thought he'd get a reward. David killed him for it. I'm telling you, we have this mamby-pamby thing. Let's just be nice to everybody. We'll win them by being nice. You ain't going to win them by being nice. You're going to prove that you're stupid by uh, trying to sell your nice personality instead of giving the gospel. From Haman, the Agagite. He was from Aga. He, he was not a uh, Persian. He, he advanced in the ranks. He tells Ahasuerus, there's a people here because Mordecai the Jew wouldn't bow down and worship him. So he, and 127 provinces, and they set a day, and you know that the Jews still celebrate Purim today, which is the days where they were, uh, uh, when, when that law was turned for them to defend themselves. And, and that word, that saying we get, you give a man enough rope and he'll hang himself. Well, that's what they did. Hang in, ha, uh, Haman uh, built a gallows to kill uh, Mordecai. Uh, he just hated him so much, and he got hung on his own gallows. Then his ten sons got hung on it. But the motivation, it was satanic to destroy all the Jews. Now, you read it. It says all the Jews. He wanted to kill all the Jews. Now you got that in the pogroms of the Pale of Russia when the Jews and the settlements were up there uh, during the uh, 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 13, 14, 15, 16, 17th centuries. The Jews were the, the, the diaspora, or I think that's what they called them. They were dispersed all throughout the world. You have Chinese Jews, you got Russian Jews, you got German Jews, you got uh, Brazilian Jews. You, you know, you got Jews all over the world. And, uh, and so. Uh, uh, the the uh, idea since then was to always kill the Jews. That's what Hitler said was the final solution. Every, every attempt in history, both in secular history and in Bible history, has been to kill the Jews by violence, right? Can you think of an exception? By peace he shall destroy many. Israel celebrated its 
70th birthday. That's significant. They were 70 years in captivity. On their 70th birthday, do you remember what happened? Danny was preaching that Wednesday right after that. That was on a Monday. Danny was preaching here, and he brought it to our minds, too, again, when he was preaching. Do you know what happened that Monday? They opened up the embassy in, Israel, in uh, Jerusalem, what David called the capital. He was in Hebron for six and a half years. Then he set, he set up there, and they set up there, the, and you've seen the bloodshed that was outside the wall there. And one of the reporters in that, in that uh, ceremony for the embassy said, this is the safest place on the planet. I, I saw it. And I really don't watch that much news, but I saw that. I, I thought that was significant. I wanted to watch it. And by peace he shall destroy. The Jews right now have the greatest ally they've ever had in the United States. Ronald Reagan wasn't the ally because he was playing politics, and I really liked Ronald Reagan. But he was still playing politics, you know, because of the balance of power in the Middle East and in uh, Russia. This president that we have, and let me say something, I am thankful to God that Hillary is not in there. I, I am. But this president that we have now is approaching the Jews in a way they've never been approached before. And when I talk to that, when I talk to that um, uh, um, uh, Orthodox Jewish woman, and she was Orthodox, and I've known some, when they have, uh, uh, when they have Passover, that when they, people used the wallpaper, they, it didn't matter. That wallpaper could last 20 years, but they would take it down that next year for Passover because the the glue that held the wallpaper to the wall had leaven in it, and they stripped all of their house of leaven. I know people that have done that. I've talked to Jews in their own house, and they're asking me, and I, I mean, it still amazes me, they're asking me on how to cook kosher. You know, just because I tell them I know a little bit of I wouldn't know what kosher cooking was if it bit me on the nose. But the thing of it is, is that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, right now, the Jewish people have an ally and they're being fattened for the slaughter. You say, are you sure of that? Read the book of Revelation. They run for their lives. Matthew 24, when you, hear, when you see the abomination of desolation. Now, I'm not saying this guy is the, that, but whoever's setting him up is finally going to set himself up in there and declare to be worshipped. And Jesus said, when you see that, don't even go into the house and get your clothes. Run for the mountains. We are witnessing that in history. I know that in my ignorance, not in my intelligence. I can see it. You know, we get that word, the writing on the wall. You know where that comes from? The writing on the wall? Right. It comes from uh, Daniel. <laughs> meaning, meaning, Tiku you Parson. You've been weighed in the balances, and you've been found wanting, and the Medes and the Persians are going to take your... And I read about that, too. They, they, there was an impregnable fortress. That's why... Belshazzar was up there uh, drinking himself drunk. There was no way that, uh, uh, that the uh, Persians or the Medes could breach that. But what they did was they built all these ditches around there and they diverted the river so that these soldiers could go under where the river went and the, the water was only about knee high and they went in there where there was people that was drinking themselves drunk. Well, I even put a sentry out, you know? And they took it, opened it up, and that was probably where your... Uh, where the story of the uh, Trojan horse came from, I don't know. Uh, that has never been substantiated, but uh, Gobrias going under the wall is substantiated in history, and it's substantiated in the Bible. See, now, now God said that, and they thought it was impregnable, and, and, and there's nothing with it. And God says in the book of Jeremiah, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You know, something for you to think about. Anyway, that was the point, and we are living in a day, I'm not saying that to get off on prophecy. I'm saying that, that we're living a breath away every time we take a breath. We're living a breath away from bowing in the presence of Jesus Christ. And one other thing, regardless of what your imagination dictates, when Jesus Christ returns, whatever your imagination dictates about the people coming out of the grave and people sitting in a church or in their living room watching TV and they just go on up and they just go on up and they transform in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Whatever your imagination dictates that that looks like, one thing's for sure is somebody's going to be here just like you and somebody's going to be here just like me. So why not me? Why not you? 
Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We pray, dear God, that as we look into these things, that we won't just be smarter, but we'll be more uh, inclined to love you and to serve you. And Father, uh, we just let you be God in our lives, and then anything else, what happens to us, it'll be by your permission or by your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.